Ann, just a heads up, Ann, we're going to have the camera down here uh, right up until the sermon. Uh, I'll be leading the, the prayer time this morning, so just so you know. Good morning, church. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to Williamstown First Baptist Church in Williamstown, Massachusetts. If you're just finding us on YouTube, this is where we're located. And we'd love to have you join us at some point for, uh, for Sunday morning worship service. Before we begin with our worship time this morning, our call to worship today. It's from uh, Psalm 150, great and glorious and exuberant psalm of praise. Verses 1, 2, and 6, and if you'd like to read along, it's, of course, in the inside front cover of our bulletin and on page 526 in the Pew Bible. Psalm 150, praise the Lord, praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him to the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we pray that our hearts would be as enthused to be in front of you, worshiping you, Lord, as was King David's of old when he penned those words. Build in us, Lord, a fire to know you better and to make you known as ambassadors for Christ. Bless our time together this morning. Keep us focused on the things that are good, and right and true and most especially Lord on those things that are eternal and do not pass away and all God's people said amen, amen. all right if you'd stand and join me we're gonna sing are you washed in the blood number 330 in our celebration hymnal. <clears throat> Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? 
Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? When the bridegroom cometh, will your robes be white? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Will your soul be ready for the mansions bright and be washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments Spotless are they white as snow. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Amen. If you'd be seated. So, uh, typically at this point in our service, we offer prayers together for uh, various excuse me for uh, various concerns that we have and for uh, healing for those who are in need of healing and um, we're going to focus this morning on praying indeed not only for our own concerns but for the concerns of the entire nation and the world. Uh, we are in a perilous time, dear friends. We had a wonderful victory this week for the cause of life in the Supreme Court, as I'm sure you are all aware. But now the battle has just begun. The battle has just begun because now it is up to individual states to take up the cause of freedom, liberty, and life, and to pass on that heritage to the next generation by means of codifying the sanctity of life into law. So we're going to pray for that. We're going to pray for wisdom for our leaders and, of course, for our needs as a community of believers and for a church as well. So uh, if you join me. Dear Heavenly Father, we bless your name, Lord. We give you thanks. We give you praise, Lord. For you indeed are worthy, Lord, of all of our highest honor, all of our praise, all of our glory. Lord, you've given us everything. You've given us life. You've given us hope. You've given us our very souls, Lord, with which to worship you and to know you. And Father, we thank you for being a good God, for being a loving God, for being a perfectly moral God. We exult, we rejoice, Lord, in your character, that you are the source of all truth, of all goodness. That it is you who breathes life into us and calls us home with you in the hereafter. So Lord, as we gather this morning, as brothers and sisters in Christ, as part of your family, heirs to your promises, we ask first of all, Lord, that you would Continue to peer into each one of our lives. Draw us ever closer, Lord. Give that which we need. Withhold that which we do not need. 
And Lord, but steadily conform us to the image of your precious son, Jesus. For those of us, Lord, with physical ailments, we ask your hand on us, Lord. We ask for your healing power to come into our lives. Lord, here in this community, we ask that we would be a light and a beacon of truth. And of your perfections, Lord, that we would declare those loudly and boldly here in Williamstown and throughout the sphere of our influences, brothers and sisters in Christ. And Lord, we ask that those who are in positions of leadership in our governments, here in Massachusetts, across the nation, and around the world, that you would draw them as well, Lord, that you would, you would inform their thinking, Lord, that you would tune their hearts to your heart, Lord, so that they might be called out of darkness and into the light of your glorious Son. And in so doing, spread that light into a lost and dying world. Thank you once again, Father. Thank you for our ability to gather together this morning. We ask, Lord, for your hand on us as we worship together this morning. And all God's people said, Amen. Have you stand and join me? We're going to be singing our next hymn, number 562, Be Thou My Vision. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou. Well 
and the labors increase to add it a Testing, one, two, three. Hey, we're on. 
It's good to be here with you this morning and to be able to open the Word of God together and to share the truths that we know are eternal and um, that should give our hearts great sense of peace and refreshment and encouragement. And that's what I'm hoping for today as we look at God's Word, that we're going to be um, greatly encouraged by the eternal perspective that God has on us as his children. I'd like us to think about our identity today in Jesus Christ, like who am I? Um, it's an interesting question because it's one of those things that philosophers always ask. It's like, who am I? Why am I here? You know, what am, what am I about? What am I supposed to be doing? What's my purpose? And um, the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, tells us very clearly how we have been blessed, the kind of grace that God has showered upon us, and how it changes everything in terms of our life here on planet Earth. And so I'd like us to turn in our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1, and we're going to just look at the first six verses today. And um, then I'm going to return in two weeks, uh, actually on the 10th of July, and do the, the remaining verses, 7 through 14. Um, so this is um, a great section that introduces us to the grace of God. We read, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him. In love... He predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which we have been made accepted in the beloved. So I begin by asking you the question, who are you? Um, and as you think about that, the answer to that question, you might be, thinking about the people around you, re relationships. You know, I'm a, I'm a grandmother, a grandfather. I'm an aunt, I'm an uncle. Some of you might be thinking in terms of what you did as a profession or what you do as a profession. Say, you know, I'm a bricklayer, I'm, a, I'm an accountant, I'm a, I'm a this or that. And, and we, we oftentimes equate what we do and who we're related to and how we're related to our identity as a person. We see ourselves in the eyes of others. And if I value, or if I see that you value me, then it's easier for me to value myself, right? We're sort of dependent. We don't like to be, but let's be honest. We are greatly influenced by what we think others think about us. The important thing, though, as Christians, we understand in our minds and hearts that the only thing that really matters is what God thinks of us, right? His opinion of us is the most important thing of all. Because, frankly, the opinions of others fluctuate, right? They may not even be thinking what we think they're thinking, but they're thinking something else, and we interpret what they're thinking as a negative connotation or criticism or um, assessment of us. So if we live by what we think other people are thinking, we're going to be fluctuating with those fluctuations. But what God says about us is always true. This is the word of God. Peter says, all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever, forever. So this is what's critical, is what does God say? We begin here by seeing that true identity, who I am as a person, is something we don't chase after, but it's something we discover. It's something that's brought to us in the gospel. 
It's, it's something that God reveals to us, like he did to the Apostle Paul. Paul says, an apostle of Jesus Christ. He's not bragging here about being an apostle. In fact, he says later that the apostles are the scum of the earth. They're treated like the dregs at the bottom of the barrel. You know, it wasn't a, it wasn't a title of honor. It was just to say, I'm a messenger boy of God appointed by him. In fact, Paul was on his way to be somebody, right, when he got confronted by Jesus on the road to Damascus. He was on his way to be that guy who would bring justice to those Christians and show them that they're wrong, they're off, they're a cult, they're not following according to the law of Moses, they're dangerous, they're a threat to society, they needed to be imprisoned and exterminated. And that's what he was doing at the time. And you can read this in Acts chapter 9. On his way, what he finds that Jesus confronts him with his blinding light, right? And he hears this voice from heaven, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So Saul falls on his face, he can't see, he's blind. He says, Lord, is, is that you? He goes, I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Jesus was taking persecution of his people very personally as he always does. When you mess with his people, you mess with him. He was persecuting Christ by persecuting us, by persecuting the church. And then Jesus says, get up, Paul. Get up, Saul. His name was Saul. And go to the city. I'm going to show you what you need to do for me. Just like that. It wasn't the four spiritual laws. Like, what do you think? Can I recruit you? You're a very ambitious man. I want to turn that ambitious and ambition into, into my cause, into promoting my king. It wasn't any of that. It was like, get up, Saul. Go into the city. I'll show you what you need to do next. And Saul's like, yeah. 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 He, he does it. Of course, he's blind. So he's led to Ananias. And Ananias, who had been prepared by the Holy Spirit, then speaks to him. And Saul regains his sight. He's renamed Paul. And he is told that he, Christ would show him how much he must suffer for the sake of the gospel. So Paul's identity, now he's out to become a big wig, but he ends up being this apostle for Jesus. He's wearing rags. He's building tents at night. He's doing whatever he can to survive. He's running from place to place. He's hiding from people who are trying to stone him. He's not this well-received Billy Graham of sorts, you know, who draws a crowd. He drew a crowd, but for the wrong reasons. So this was his new identity. But you know what Paul said about his identity? He says, I was born a Hebrew of Hebrews from the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised on the eighth day. He, sh he shares his pedigree, then he talks about how he was ambitious above his peers, and he was the hardest of all workers. He says, you know what? I count that all as rubbish for the sake of knowing Jesus. Jesus was his identity, right? Jesus was his identity. And so true identity is found in Jesus, in our relationship with him. What he says about us matters more than anything else. He says, I was called by the will of God. I didn't choose this occupation. I didn't choose following Jesus. Hi, Billy. He says, I have come because this is God's will for me. Friends, you're here because God's will for you is that you know Jesus, right? He, he confronted you in some way on the road to Damascus. He turned you around. He opened your eyes. He drew you to himself. He gave you a new identity. Your identity is not in what you do. It's not in who you know. It's not in what they think about you. It's in Jesus. I'm 
marvelous Savior we have. And so Saul says, I'm sorry, Paul says, I am writing to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus. Did you get that? Now, Ephesus is a general epistle. It's a prison epistle. Paul's writing from Rome in a prison. But this is one of the most general of his letters. It's not like Philippians or Colossians. It's very general. And so, really, it was written for Christians everywhere. It's written for us today, right? And what he's doing is he's referring to them as saints. Do you know that you're a saint if you've come to Christ? You're a sinner who's been saved by grace, and now you've been translated into his kingdom, the kingdom of light, and you are made holy. That's what saints, saint means. You have been made holy by the blood of Jesus, and now you have this position in Christ, this standing before God that he sees you through his son, no longer on the basis of your merits, no longer does he look at your failures and your shortcomings and your idiosyncrasies. He doesn't see that. He looks at you through his son. What a blessed, blessed position we have. We are saints. But saint also means that we've been set apart for him. Holy means simply that we clean something and we set it apart for a special purpose. We have been set apart for God. Now, the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, he says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body because this is the place where God dwells in you. You are his church. Collectively, we are the presence of Jesus, the place where God dwells. And so we are holy, we are saints, we are recipients of his grace, we are set apart for God. Now I want you to know that there are two strengths about the church at Ephesus. One is, I mean you can see these in Revelation chapter 2, but he says to, um, Jesus says to the church of, of Ephesus that they were intolerant of evil men and false prophets. So. They didn't put up with false teaching, nor did they accept the teaching of the Nicolaitans who taught a doctrine of compromise, implying that total separation from, between Christianity and the practice of occult paganism was not so, was not so bad. That, that's, that's sort of like the, the teaching of the Nicolaitans. And if you understand Ephesus, it's this major port city in the Mediterranean, and it was the host of Diana, or Artemis, as the Romans called her. But she was the goddess of fertility, of, um, of the springtime, of nature. She, she covered a host of different aspects of the world. But she was housed there in Ephesus, and people would come on vacay from all over the place just to see and worship in the temple, to offer things to, to Diana. So. When Paul preached Christ to the Ephesians, we can see this in Acts chapter 19, it really caused arousal. People were upset because the silversmiths who made these little idols of Diana were going out of business. And so Paul calls all kinds of problems in Ephesus. But this is where they're coming from. And the strength of Ephesus is that they did not tolerate these things but the criticism that Jesus has in the book of Revelation is that they eventually lose their first love. Do you remember that first love that you had when you came to Christ? It's like, I can't believe it, I'm saved. I can't believe it, all my sins are forgiven. I can't believe it, I'm going to heaven. I can't, I can't believe it, I'm part of the church, the body of Christ universal, that I have brothers and sisters all over the world. I can't believe it that I have the Holy Spirit living in me, always with me, that Jesus is never going to leave me or forsake me. I can't believe it that I have the power of the resurrection abiding in me, 
that I can actually live out the life of Christ to this world and be light and salt in this world? Do you remember what it was like? Do you remember? They lost their first love, their first passion for Christ. They were so busy trying to keep the truth and in the trenches and working hard that something else kind of fell to the wayside and it was something significant. It was their love for Jesus, their appreciation for all he had done for them, and their love for one another. Are these two mutually exclusive? Do they have to be? Absolutely not. We hold to the truth, but we love with a passion in the heart of Christ. And under Timothy's pastoral care, he had been appointed pastor of Ephesus for two years, they really flourished. But at some point, they started to wane. So I want you to consider two things in particular that have to do with your identity as a Christian. And the first of those things is that we have been chosen in Christ. He says this in verse 4, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. This tells us something, friends. God, whose mind is immense, without limits, understanding all things from ancient past to eternal future, he had you in mind. He knew who you were, but it was more than just foreknowledge. He understood you, and he drew you to himself. He knew that you would come to know him, that you would love him, and he drew you to himself. You did not choose him. He chose you so that you would be a vessel of mercy, a vessel of honor for him. That is a marvelous privilege that just leads us to humility because it says to me, it's nothing I've done to earn this salvation. He chose me as his. And then he revealed himself to me. Of all people, he revealed himself to me in time and space, in my experience, in life. And he made himself known using my needs and my brokenness and my sin and my failures to bring me to him, to show me that I can't do life apart from Jesus. He who made me knows me intimately and wants to live his life out through me and with me. That's why he talks about that yoke in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. He says, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Because he wants to be in the yoke with us every day. He wants to teach us, and that's what discipleship is all about, is it's following Christ in the trenches of life and seeing how all of life is a school to draw us closer to Christ, to teach us more about this great God of mercy and grace. You have been chosen by him. You have been set apart for him. And he has blessed you. And then he says to us that we have been chosen for a reason, that we would be holy and without blame before him. Again, he returns to that idea of holiness, that you're set apart for him. The Apostle Paul talks about this to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, when he talks about in a large house, there's a lot of different kinds of vessels or utensils that are used. Some are used for common purposes, you know, a spittoon, a, a night potty, those kinds of very functional kinds of vessels. And some are used for, for very honorable purposes, you know, the chalice, the, the crystal that brought out at certain times. He says, if you cleanse yourself from these things, you will be used by God as a vessel of honor to be used by God in this world. So how do we cleanse ourselves? When we fall as Christians, we have a savior. He's called an advocate. That means he comes alongside us. And we confess our sins, 
And we know that his word teaches us that he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. That he picks us back up, sets us on our feet, and says, keep walking. No laying in the gutters. Keep walking. I'm with you. You are clean. I have forgiven you. My blood was shed for you. There's no wallowing in the gutters. There is only forward motion in the Christian life. You are a vessel fit for honor for God's purposes. He chose us in him. And then he tells us that he has predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to his good pleasure, the good pleasure of his will. Do you know that you have been predestined to become an adopted child? It means that, you know, we're that child sitting in the orphanage, waiting for adoption. We don't have parents that really love us. We're waiting, and we're waiting. And then Jesus comes along, and he, he selects us, and he says, you're my son, you're my daughter. And the, what that means then is that we have a new position. We are related to him, and we have his name. We are a brother to Jesus. We have a heavenly father who we can call upon. So it's a change in our position. We have all the rights that a real child has, a, a biological son or daughter. We also have the privilege of coming to him as our daddy. That's why he says in Galatians, we come to him and we call him Abba Father, daddy, the most intimate of terms. Do you know Christ that way? Do you know your father that way? Can you come to your father with all of your concerns and say, daddy, I need you. I don't understand this. I don't understand what life is bringing me. I don't understand what, I don't know what to do. Whatever your concern is, you bring it to your father who loves you and cares for you. He says, bring it to the throne of grace that you might find help in time of need. Christ is there interceding on our behalf, praying for us. We can't lose, friends. We come to a father who loves us. So why do we resist coming? Why don't we pray as though it really mattered? Why don't we seek him with our whole hearts? That's our position as sons and daughters, as saints, as his beloved chosen ones. We are his. We can come to him as we are and know that Christ died for us. His blood has been shed so that we might be forgiven and have a standing before him as his children, what's keeping us from really drawing near to him? He says, all of this has been done because of his grace, which he made known to us in his beloved son, Jesus. This tells us God's heart for us. God's heart for us is beyond our understanding how much he loves us and cares for us. That he has set us up for eternity. We sang this morning, Thou mine inheritance. We have an inheritance that is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for us. We have an, an inheritance that's summed up in Jesus. Our inheritance is Christ. We'll be with him forever in his presence. Thou mine inheritance will be in the presence of God. Let's rejoice as Christians. Let's live as though we are saints. Because that's what God has called us and that's what God sees us as. And let's be salt and light in the world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for your love and grace. We thank you that you have only good intentions for us and that our identity 
is found in the gospel that you have made us saints that you have made us your children that you have adopted us into your family that you have given us value because of your love for us we thank you for sending Jesus we thank you for a Savior who never leaves us or forsakes us now I ask your blessing upon each person today Lord that you would help us to come more fully into the recognition of who we are in Christ and that we may not chase after our identity but discover it again and again in the gospel at every stage of life I pray this in Jesus name Amen well dear friends what a blessing that we have friends like brother Doug who can step in and bring us such a poignant inspiring message in Chuck's absence thank you Doug he'll be back of course in a couple of weeks and we'll be looking once again at Ephesians 1 let's close this morning with a hymn that extols God's majesty. Father, thank you so much for our time together this morning. 
Lord, bless us throughout the week. Keep your word in our hearts, Lord. And keep us safe and well until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, dear friends. God bless. Have a great afternoon. Oh, we do have uh, s snacks in the fellowship hall if you'd like to join us for a coffee and a...